Hey guys, Gore here. Welcome back to the channel. Today, I've got a big one for you. We're going to be covering every anti-tank launcher in the game, how to use them in regards to zeroing and aiming, and where on different vehicles you should be hitting. Also in this guide, we'll be taking a look at some strategies and miscellaneous tips to help you rid the battlefield of enemy vehicles. The anti-tank kits in squad are by far some of the most important when it comes to the team's overall chances of success in the end, so we're going to leave no stone unturned. If you enjoyed today's guide, leave it a like and subscribe for more future squad content. I also stream squad every weekday over on Twitch where I help out new players, answer questions, and play with viewers. The streams are an absolute blast, so drop by sometime. Now, let's get into things. First and foremost, I have a ton of information to share with you in this guide. For those that may only be looking for a specific launcher or want to be able to come back to this video in the future to brush up on something, I'll have every section timestamped so you can skip right to what you're looking for. To start, let's take a look at the anti-tank kits in squad and go over some of the general information about them. Firstly, we have the light anti-tank kit or LAT. LATs have weaker anti-tank rounds meant for engaging lighter vehicles or disabling components on the heavier VIX. In the kit selection screen, the LAT is a part of the fire support roles. Take note that any given squad is allowed a maximum of three fire support roles, so in the situation where you need AT and you already have an AR, a Grenadier, and a Marksman, one of those three will have to switch because no one else will be able to grab a lat kit. All lat rounds in the game besides the AT4 have a rearm cost of 30 ammo. The heavy anti-tank kit, or HAT, is equipped with a more powerful anti-tank round meant for doing large amounts of damage to any vehicle on the battlefield. Hats are a specialist role and thus are limited to two per team. The hat kits are one of the most important units on the battlefield, so the role should not be chosen lightly. I highly recommend familiarizing yourself with the hat kits before picking one up in game so this doesn't happen to you. <laughs> to piggyback off that clip, let's take a look at the arming distance for the different launchers. If you have never heard the term previously, arming distance is the distance a projectile must travel before it becomes active and can inflict damage on a target. For all lat kits in the game, you must be at least 25 meters away from your target in order for the rocket to arm. The arming distance for the different hat rounds varies. The RPG-7 and RPG-7 V2 tandem rounds only need to travel 22 meters to arm. The Carl Gustav, the RPG-28, and the RPG-29 require 40 meters for arming. And lastly, the British Enlaw needs to travel approximately 65 meters to arm. If you fail to distance yourself far enough away from your target, you'll be greeted by a very embarrassing sound, accompanied by you likely being killed by the vehicle you just shot at. In instances where you don't know if you're far enough away, it's better to be safe than sorry. Either move further back, have your SL mark the vehicle so you know the distance, or use the grid squares on the map to approximate how far away the vehicle is from you. Before we get into each of the different kits and launchers, there's one overarching thing that applies to every anti-tank kit in the game. That is, disabling shots are your first priority. If the shot you're about to fire is not going to kill the target and the vehicle is not already disabled, you need to aim for a component that won't allow it to escape. These components being the engine, the tracks, or an interior wheel on an eight-wheeled vehicle. That last one might sound a little weird, but we're going to go into more detail later in the video. Oftentimes, you may not have the ammo to finish off a vehicle yourself, so secure its fate by disabling its ability to move so that either another AT can finish it or a friendly vehicle can come clean up the scraps. First on our list of launchers today is the Law. It is employed by the US, British, and Canadian factions. The Law can be zeroed from 100 to 400 meters. This rocket is as basic as it gets. It's by no means powerful, so if you're looking to inflict more than just a small amount of damage to a medium vehicle, make sure you have a rifleman and his ammo bag nearby. This round does have a fair amount of drop-off, so shooting targets in between zeroing ranges can be a bit tricky. A rocket that is much like the law is the Russian RPG-26. The RPG-26 has one of the most intimidating sights when you first pick up the kit, but once you're accustomed, it allows for accurate shots from a wider variety of ranges. You can zero the launcher from 50 to 200 meters with the options being 50, 100, 150, and 250. The special trick with this launcher is that when you're arranged at either 150 or 250, the red arrow will be the zeroed range, while the bottom of the bar adds 50 meters, thus allowing you to shoot accurately at 200 and 300 meters respectively. With these two additions, you now have the entire spectrum of 50 to 300 meters covered in 50 meter increments. The American Lat has the option to take the Law, or they can choose to take the AT-4. This launcher inflicts more damage to armored targets and thus has a higher reload cost sitting at 60 instead of the typical 30 of the other Lat kits. 
Subjectively, the AT4 is one of my favorite launchers in squad for a few reasons. The first being its incredibly fast trial time and minimal drop off over distance. These two things together make this launcher incredibly easy to use and easy to be effective against enemy armor. Next, this rocket has the ability to be zeroed from 100 to 500 meters, but wait, there's more. When you're zeroed at any range, the tip of the sight is the range that you're zeroed at, while the flat line where the three prongs meets adds 100 meters to any range. Meaning, when you're zeroed at 200 meters and a target is 300 meters away, you do not need to zero in order to take an accurate shot. This can come in handy when you only have a small window of opportunity to take a shot and your seconds are precious. Lastly, why this launcher is one of my favorites is its ability to one-shot helicopters. Why this rocket kills a helo while a tandem round only sets it on fire is beyond me, but you can turn any battlefield into a no-fly zone with the AT-4. If you're new to the anti-tank role, my suggestion is to use this kit as your first. It is simple to use and has some forgiveness. Next up, we have the RPG-7 used by the Irregular Militia and Insurgents. The RPG-7 can fire three different rounds a 40mm fragmentation, a heat round, and a tandem. The fragmentation and heat rounds share the same characteristics with both being able to be zeroed from 100 to 500 meters. Some of the lat kits for these two factions are equipped with multiple heat rounds, so if a vehicle has multiple components that can be disabled, like a Bradley's tracks and engine, try to hit more than one. This will lead to a greater repair time for the enemy vehicle, which will raise the chances of you or someone on your team securing the vehicle kill. The anti-personnel fragmentation rounds are reason enough to use one of the RPG-7 kits. With an explosive range of 16 meters and one-shot lethal range of anyone on full health of about 9 meters, these rockets allow you to reach out and touch lone targets or groups of enemies and inflict massive casualties. Finally, with the RPG-7 we have the tandem round which can only be found on the hat kit. The tandem round can be zeroed from 50 to 150 meters. This rocket is like throwing a bag of bricks, so at any distance over 100 meters, I do not recommend shooting at a moving target. The travel time accompanied by the drop lead to you being quite ineffective versus anything that is not static. Following up the RPG-7 is the RPG-7 V2. These launchers are identical in use with the V2 being equipped with a PGO-7 2.8 times rocket drop compensator. As we've already gone over the capability of the RPG-7's rounds, we'll skip right to what all the lines on the scope mean. The optic has ranging for both the fragmentation and heat rounds and the tandem rounds. Starting with the frag and heat, the top plus sign is 50 meters, with the smaller plus below it being 100 meters. From there, we can follow the line along the left side of the scope from 200 down to 500 meters. For the tandem round, the first ranging mark we have is the double horizontal line found at the 300 meter mark, which is 50 meters for the tandem. From there, we have the 100 meter line found just underneath the 500 meter line for the heat round followed by 150 and 200 meter horizontal lines. This optic also has vertical lines. These are used for leading a moving target. From the center line outwards, each line represents 10 kilometers per hour travel speed in increments of 10, with the very outside lines allowing you to lead a target moving at 50 kilometers per hour. It is quite difficult to know how fast a vehicle is traveling, so in most occasions, you'll have to use your best judgment. When firing the tandem round from the RPG-7 and 7v2, I found that it's best to aim a little high as the rounds have so much drop that even when aimed correctly, they can still land just short if you don't hold your sights higher up on the VIC. For gauging distance, there's a stadiometric rangefinder found on the right side of the sight of the 7v2. It is the exact same rangefinder found on every pair of binoculars and squad, save one important detail, the height it measures. The rangefinder found on the RPG 7v2 is for targets that are 2.7 meters tall, while the one on the binoculars are used for targets 1.7 meters tall. Luckily, both of these can be used to accurately gauge the distance of an enemy vehicle. The difference being that if the rangefinder is for 2.7 meter tall targets, you measure the vehicle in its entirety, and for the 1.7 meter rangefinder, you measure the vehicle without the turret. The way to use either is to place the target at the large opening of the rangefinder with the tracks or wheels on top of the flat bottom line. Move the target from the larger opening towards the smaller end until the top of the vehicle touches the sloped upper line. Always take note of what height the rangefinder is used for so you know whether to include or exclude the turret. With V2, a new launcher was introduced to the Russians, the RPG-28. This launcher is, at this moment in time, my absolute favorite in the game. Taking a look at the optic, the plus sign is for 100 meters and then there's a chevron for targets at 300 and 500 meters respectively. It also has vertical lines for leading targets at 5 and 10 kilometers per hour. 
While the optic itself doesn't provide you with a multitude of range marks to use, it is incredibly intuitive to split the difference between the range indicators for targets that are not exactly at 1, 3, or 500 meters. The rocket sight is also equipped with the same stadiometric rangefinder found on the RPG-7 V2. The other launcher that was introduced in V2 is the new British Enlaw. This launcher is the first ever to implement predicted line of sight, which allows you to fire at a moving target and your round will alter trajectory based on how quickly you move your sight. The launcher also has a direct attack mode, which can be toggled via holding your X key and scrolling up. The direct attack mode is tremendously straightforward. The rockets have no drop. Their only downside is having a max effective range of 600 meters at which the rocket will run out of propellant and fall to the ground. The Enlaw also has the highest arming range of any launcher sitting at 65 meters, so don't be afraid to get some extra distance between yourself and a nearby target to ensure it arms. Additionally, the Enlaw sits at a rearm cost of 90 instead of the typical 80 for the other heavy anti-tank rounds. The predicted line of sight mode is a bit trickier, so let's take an in-depth look at it. With the PLOS mode on, place your crosshair on your target and hold it there while the vehicle moves. I recommend you steady your aim by holding shift during this process. Keep the vehicle in your sights for as long or as short as you need until you feel comfortable that they won't increase or decrease in speed, then fire the rocket. You can continue tracking the vehicle in your sights or you can walk away. It does not change the trajectory of the round. As long as you kept your reticle on the vehicle and didn't speed past it, your round should land. When holding your sights on a moving vehicle, I do recommend holding at the vertical center line. Holding too low may lead to you only tracking the vehicle and leaving the hull otherwise undamaged. Predicted line of sight only accounts for horizontal movement, not vertical. If a target is moving down a hill towards you and you fire at it, the round will land wherever your sight was when you fired. While this mode is incredibly cool and the feeling of landing a successful shot is exhilarating, it is not dependable. Targets must be moving on flat ground perpendicular to you for the launcher to work as intended. Changes in elevation of the vehicle can lead to your round missing its mark. The end law is extremely powerful when the round does hit, so it's best to try to hit a target when static if possible. The RPG-29 has two variants over three different factions with the Irregular Militia and Insurgents receiving the Iron Sight variant while the MEA RPG-29 has an optic. This launcher stands apart from all the other heavy anti-tank kits in the game by carrying not just one, but two tandem rounds. These rounds inflict massive damage to armored targets, so take your time to hit your shots and you'll be greatly rewarded. This launcher also has an incredibly long reload time, so it's best to get your launcher out and load it early so a vehicle doesn't fly right past you and you never have the chance to shoot. The sight on the Insurgent and Militia RPG-29 is one of the most confusing in the game based off how it can be used in two different ways. The first being what you would expect. If you're zeroed at 100 meters, you use the first of the four red chevrons. At 300 meters zero, you use the third red chevron. Where things get weird is that you can employ this launcher accurately up to 750 meters, all while still zeroed at 100. I'm gonna put a picture up on screen now for you to look at showing you where to aim for different distances while zeroed at 100 meters. Notice how the lines once you get to 500 meters and beyond don't have much of a reference point. Once you get past 400 meters, this launcher becomes quite tough to get rounds on target. I recommend keeping your engagement range to 400 meters or less. Now there's no distinct advantage to zeroing the site or not, it's purely based off your own preference, so pick one or the other and stick to it as to not confuse yourself. The MEA's RPG-29 is much simpler with an optic with range marks from 100 to 800 meters. The site also has vertical lines to lead vehicles traveling at speeds up to 25 kilometers per hour. The optic is incredibly easy to read, with the top plus sign range for 100 meters and each successive ranging mark down increasing in increments of 100 meters. The hat for the American is the M3 Maws. The M3 fires three different rounds, a heat, a tandem, and is the only AT kit in the game equipped with smoke rounds. The effective range on the M3 is the best in the game with not only the ability to range your shots, but also the sight having ranging marks. The tandem can be zeroed up to 500 meters, while the heat and smoke can be zeroed up to 700. The sight is set up in such a way that the top chevron is whatever you're zeroed to, and then each successive mark down, whether it be a plus or a minus sign, adds 50 meters. So essentially, you can zero your heat round to 700 meters and then aim at the bottom plus sign, and you'll be able to somewhat effectively engage a target at 1200 meters. Do I recommend this? Not really, unless you've got ammo to burn. Where it does come in handy is with the M3's smoke rounds. 
On impact, the smoke rounds are more or less the same as a smoke round shot from a mortar. So if you need to shield the vision of an enemy's emplaced MG so your squad can maneuver or block off the vision of enemies in a high-rise building, the M3 has you covered. The two different anti-tank rounds with this kit have a very different velocities with the heat round flying flatter and faster. With this in mind, for more difficult shots where you're unsure if you'll hit the target, use the heat round instead of the tandem. Not only will it help show you if you're aimed too high or too low, but it's a much more forgiving round if you're off by a little bit. The Canadians have an older version of the American M3 in the Carl Gustav M2. It fires the same rounds, with the exception being that instead of smoke rounds, one of the two hat kits is equipped with high explosive rounds. The sight on the M2 doesn't have ranging marks, but does have the ability to be zeroed. The heat and tandem round can be zeroed from 100 to 700 meters, while the HE rounds can be zeroed all the way up to 1000 meters. Everything remains the same as far as strategy with the AT round with the M2 in relation to the M3. This kit really stands out because of the high explosive rounds. These rounds are basically like man portable tank shells. With a lethal range on a full health target coming in at a whopping 13 meters, these puppies are squad killers. With their explosive radius on top of the effective range of the rounds via zeroing, this launcher packs a massive punch versus vehicles and infantry. The HE rounds and fragmentation rounds fired from the RPG-7 and 7v2 can only be used to damage infantry targets and will inflict no damage on an armored target. Now that we've covered all the different launchers in the game, let's take a look at some of the different strategies, tips, and information to help you become more proficient and thus more dangerous with the anti-tank kits. There's two sides to the coin when it comes to playing the Hat Kitten Squad. On one side, you have the fact that you're a massive tool to help rid the map of vehicles, thus you should always be chasing them down. The other side of the coin is vehicles will always seek out infantry, so if you're with your squad, the VIX will come to you. I've had experiences where both of these have worked, but I will always encourage the latter. Yes, you may catch up to the enemy vehicle, secure the kill, and crown yourself the savior of your team. But more times than not, you're going to keep chasing, and chasing, and chasing, never getting a good chance to take a shot, or never having enough ammo to finish a vehicle off. The last thing you want is to be off on your own and have your squad get wiped out by a vehicle that could have been a mere speed bump if you had stayed with them. Like we said earlier in the video, your first priority as AT, whether as lat or hat, is to disable the vehicle. There's only a few disabling shots available to you being the tracks, engine, or an interior wheel. Tracks are pretty straightforward, but we'll take a look at the engine and interior wheel shots. Vehicles and squad don't have a universal engine location. Some are in the front, others in the back. There are some visual indicators in game to help us figure out where it is located. On some vehicles, like the ones currently being shown on screen, you'll either see barbed wire or coiled up black cable. Not every vehicle has one or the other, but these are the engine locations for those who have one of the two present. There are a few other things to take note of when it comes to engine locations. Firstly, all main battle tanks have their engine located in the rear of the vehicle. All the IFVs and APCs in squad, minus the BTR-80 and 82A, have their engine located in the front left when facing the vehicle. One thing to note with engine shots on any 8-wheeled vehicle is that it will carry on more momentum, can still move at a slow pace and flat ground, and can pick up a large amount of speed when on a downhill slope. How we can combat this momentum is with an interior wheel shot. This isn't technically a disabling shot, but for whatever reason, if an 8-wheeled APC or IFB loses one of its four interior wheels, it is slowed to a crawl almost immediately. For the sake of providing all information, I'm including this in the guide. However, I do always recommend going for an engine shot over an interior wheel, as when the engine is disabled, the hull of the vehicle is also damaged. Wheel shots can damage the hull, but it has a lesser chance of doing so. Speaking of aiming for components, many of the medium to heavy vehicles have ammo racks which when hit will either destroy the vehicle immediately or will cause the ammo rack to cook off. Once a vehicle reaches this cook off state, it only has several seconds before it'll be destroyed. While ammo rack shots offer a high reward for your efforts, they are not easy to hit. One thing I wanna add about the difficulty is with the V2 update, intended or not, ammo racks have become much easier to hit. The best way to identify where a vehicle's ammo rack is is by jumping in Jensen's range and heading over to the vehicle display. Here, you can take a closer look at the inner workings of each VIC and identify where the ammo rack is placed. Typically, when aiming for an ammo rack, you must hit the vehicle from a specific side or angle. Take the Abrams for example, the ammo rack is located in the back left just below the packs strapped to the turret. This ammo rack can be hit from the left side, but not the right. 
If one of these shots presents itself, take the chance and you may be rewarded. When aiming at a vehicle, keep in mind the angle you're shooting at and where on the Vic you're aiming. If your angle is too great or you're aiming at the strong front armor of a tank, your round may bounce off and inflict zero damage to the target. Knowing the exact distance to a target as AT can be the difference between you hitting your shot and missing it. By far, the best way to get the most accurate range to your desired target is by using your fire team leader mark and having your squad leader place their mark on it, giving you an exact distance. Keep in mind that once you get past 300 meters, the SL mark will round to the nearest 50, so targets beyond that distance won't be as precise. Speaking of fire teams, when your SL is assigning players, request that a rifleman be placed in your fire team. Oftentimes, the rockets you carry won't be enough to finish off some of the heavier vehicles in the game. For these situations, riflemen are your best friend. They can carry 100 ammo in their bag, thus allowing you to rearm a single tandem or multiple smaller rockets from one bag. Hitting that Hail Mary shot is awesome when it does land, but don't ever waste rockets for the sake of firing at a vehicle. Part of being an effective anti-tank player is understanding when not to shoot. If you're currently overextended or the availability of ammo is sparse, holding fire for a low success shot is advised. Yes, you may hit it, but if the vehicle doesn't die from that shot, they're more than likely going to get away and you'll be out of a rocket that you could have used on a vehicle that rolls up five minutes from now that is a much more imminent threat to you and your teammates. The same goes for unnecessary shots. If a Lodgy is driving by, don't waste a rocket. Pull out your rifle and shoot out the driver to bring the vehicle to a halt. From there, you can either disable the vehicle by shooting out some of its wheels or you can choose to destroy it. If you have multiple friendlies nearby, it is much more ammo efficient to shoot the Lodgy with your rifle versus using any AT round on it. Vehicles and squad that become disabled don't magically repair themselves. Typically, one or more of the crewmen manning the Vic will jump out and attempt to get their vehicle operational again. In the instance where you disable an enemy vehicle but are out of ammo and can't finish it off, don't go running away. If you can get into a concealed position nearby, you can kill dismounting crew members that are attempting to repair the vehicle. By delaying the repairs, you give your fellow AT and armor the ability to be advised of the situation and if possible, move in for the kill. Remember to be patient. Good vehicle crews won't immediately jump out and will scan for threats or wait for reinforcements. The last tip I've got for you is don't be afraid to make mistakes. You can spend countless hours in the training range and still never be prepared for every situation that may arise. Learn from your mistakes. If you missed a shot because you forgot to re-zero your weapon, make a mental note to always check your zero before shooting. And at the end of the day, have fun with the kit. It's by far mine and many others' favorites for a reason, so keep training with it so you can become the go-to guy when vehicles are out and about. Anyways, that's all I've got for you today. I hope you enjoyed the guide, and now you're ready to get out on the battlefield and lay waste to any vehicle that dares come near. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments down below, and I'll do my best to answer them. Thanks for watching, and until next time, I'm out.